I don't need that one. You might need that one, but I don't need that one. Good morning. Good morning. Boy, what an enthusiastic group. Good morning. Good morning. That's a little better. See all those people are smiling back at you. Can you smile at them? Almost. All right. Yeah, it's Sunday. It's summertime. Are we bored yet with summer? We really wish school was back in session so we had something to do. Uh, one. One. <laughs> Everyone else, no. It doesn't mean that I'm not bored to death. Ugh, it's hot. Gosh, then we have church on Sunday. It's not like you got nothing to do all the rest of the week, but boy, we got to go to church on Sunday and smile and look nice. Who got to go to camp this past week? You did. I saw your picture. Yep. You hold it up higher. Excited. Man, I went to camp. A few of you. All right. What was the best part of camp? Let's see. What was the best part of camp? Canoeing. Canoeing. Best part of camp. There's so many things you just can't think of it, right? Yeah, I can't, I can't think of any. Archery. They're all too fun, right? Archery. Archery. Mm, crafts. Crafts. Archery. Archery. Okay. I used to dean camp. I used to be a dean at camp and lead camp. And we wasn't just for one day. It was for a whole week. Oh, my gosh. Can you think of going up there and having that much fun for a whole week? The only problem is you don't get to sleep in your own bed. You don't get to see your mom and dad. For some of us, that might not be a bad thing. But for some of us, that's a scary thing. But it's a whole week of getting to have fun and learn about God and be in nature. Our camp, our camp was called Lagawa. And this was in Oregon. And it had a waterfall had a waterfall that you could slide down and go through the waterfall into a big pool of water. It was really cool. A lot of fun. We go up there at least once a week and, and get to go in the water. But it's all that opportunity to spend time with friends, to do crafts, archery, canoeing, all sorts of different activities. But at the center of all of it, is what? God. 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 It's the important thing. Because we just heard uh, Noah sing a song that talked about this is my father's world, right? And if we get out there, and it's, it's, not, it's not as dad, Mr. Selinsky, right? It's our father, God. Well, it's both. Oh, okay, it's both. You own the whole world, Matt. I'm impressed. I'm going to come by and talk to you about that a little later. It's God's world. And when we get to go to camp, we get to see that in a real way. So I hope as you get older and you feel like that opportunity and you want to do that a little bit longer, get to spend that whole week at camp, that you'll have time to do that and it'll change your life. All right? Let's pray. Dear God, this is your world. Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Help us to look for you in all the things we see in nature. Help us to be open to hearing your voice. Not just in the summertime. Not just when we're at camp. Not just when we're at church. Because you're always there. You're always talking to us. Help us to hear you always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. This week's scripture lesson is a real simple one. God uses little things to do big things. Kind of plays out as a major theme in next week's lesson, too, as David meets Goliath 
or at least that's how that story traditionally gets preached. We'll be looking at that one a little bit differently. So the little big sermon is right here. It's a major theme of the whole of the Bible. I think I've even touched upon it on this pulpit already once before. God takes the little, the small, the poor, the worthless, the insignificant, does great things with them, right? God chose Jacob over Esau. God used Moses to defeat Pharaoh. Joshua felled the walls of Jericho by simply marching around them and making some noise. God raises Gideon and a small army of 300. They defeat the Midianite army of thousands. In theological terms, we call these reversals. Reversals. It's a reversal of expectation. Scripture, it's used so very, very, very much that we almost come to expect it. We've heard all the stories before, which most of us have. We know it's coming. So there's the question in all that. You know it's coming, and you already know the answer to the story. Do you believe it? Do you believe in it? That's the thing that matters in all the stories of the Bible. Do you believe? It's a question that might get asked a lot from this pulpit in this current season, because if you believe, then it should be obvious in how you think and speak and act. I can't say that in my 50 years of living and breathing that I've noticed a lot of people who think and speak and act as if they believe. So don't feel too bad. The other 2.2 billion Christians aren't doing all that much better. But let me show you what we're really talking about. But it does mean digging into the most gruesome story probably in all of Scripture. Judges eleven twenty nine through 39a. Then the Lord's spirit came on Jephthah. He passed through Gilead and Manassas and then to Mizpath to Gilead and from there he crossed over to the Ammonites. Jephthah made a solemn promise to the Lord. If you will decisively hand over the Ammonites to me, then whatever comes out the doors of my house to greet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites will be given to the Lord. I will sacrifice it as an entirely burnt offering. Joseph crossed over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord handed them over to him. It was an exceptionally great defeat. He defeated 20 towns so the Ammonites were brought down before the Israelites. But when Jephthah came home to his house in Mizpah, it was his daughter who came out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was an only child. He had no other son or daughter except her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me to my knees. You are my agony, for I opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. But she replied to him, My father, you've opened your mouth to the Lord so that you should do what to me you have promised. After all, the Lord has carried out just punishment for you on your enemies, the Ammonites. Then she said to her father, let this one thing be done for me. May I hold off for two months and let me go with my friends and water the hills in sadness, crying over the fact I have no children. 
Go, he responded, and sent her away for two months, and she and her friends walked the hills and cried because she would never have children. And when two months had passed, she returned to her father, and he did to her what he had promised. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Did you catch the real problem of Jephthah? Did you hear it? Or did you miss it in the face of the tragedy? Jephthah said, if you will decisively hand over the Ammonites to me, The problem is pride, power, honor, glory. Call it what you will. But Jephthah wants it for himself. And he wants God to provide it. I will sacrifice it as an entirely burnt offering. Not to honor God for what God has done, but out of thanksgiving for what God has done for me. Brothers and sisters, what happens is that we will not, do not trust God to take care of our cares, our worries, our concerns, our crises. The ones in our lives are the ones of our loved ones. We would rather take care of it ourselves, and if God's providence comes through, And even if we notice it as God's providence rather than claiming it to be our own sheer, dumb, random luck or good fortune, we give thanks. But to turn these things over to God would mean potentially waiting for God's time, putting trust and faith into the smallest, shortest, poorest, least of these types to take care and control of the situation and provide adequate resolution. And we all know we just aren't going to let that happen, are we? So we don't. That's the point, isn't it? God chooses the lost and the last, the smallest, the shortest, the poorest, the foulest, the saddest, So that whatever it is that needs to be done, whatever it is, cannot possibly have done by anything other than the divine power of the infinite God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. It was not long after Jamie and I had bought our first house in Medford, Oregon, and my mother had moved down to live with us that I ran into such a season. It's the spring of 1996. Jared was all of one years old. Jamie was working for city government. And it was time for our annual evaluations at the Great Bear Creek Corporation, home of Harry and David, where I worked. I went in to see my boss. I was told that my position was being eliminated. There would be a one-month transition where I would work with those who would be taking over, those people who reported to me. I asked to take the rest of that day off. Drove up the road and told Jamie the great news. I think that the response the company was expecting of me was anger. That I'd get mad, that I'd walk out in a huff, that I'd quit right on the spot, absolving them of any further liability. I didn't. I might have had it been a year earlier, 
but things had changed significantly in that year. Jared was one year old. We had been living in our house for one and a half years. We had been attending church again regularly over that same amount of that time. And more than anything else, we had been in the midst of Disciple One Bible study. A 40-week intensive study of the whole Bible. In fact, it had been in a recent session at that time that we had gone over the definition of a word faith. And a spry young gentleman of 80 some odd years old who knew far better than I was quick and on the spot with Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now the definition of faith is this, the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. When I found out this news, I decided it was my chance, my opportunity to be a person of faith. God would provide. I would not worry about what this month might mean. When I returned the next day, I called a staff meeting of all those who reported me to tell to them, and it turned out they already knew. I told them I didn't know who would be assigned to, for them to be reporting to in the future, that over the course of the next month, I'd be learning about that and would let them know, and we'd work through this transition. They informed me they already knew that they had started reporting to them just the day before. Again, I did not get mad. I did not quit on the spot. I went to my desk went about my work, which was almost non-existent. I'd walk around, see if anyone needed anything, see if there were any questions. Within a day or two, I was informed that I could come in, check in, see if there were any questions by anyone, and go home. Don't worry about vacation time or hours. I would be paid for the whole day to just come and collect my check. By the end of the week, I didn't even have to come in anymore. I put my faith in God. I claimed that God would provide. Now, that doesn't mean I sat around and did nothing. I visited our employment office with some regularity. I put my name in on a few jobs I felt qualified to do. I stopped in at unemployment and checked their job listings on a regular basis. And the days ticked by. My final week came and I went to my exit interview two days before I would collect my last paycheck. And on my way home, the phone rang and they left a message that I returned. A supervisor and a manager calling in a computer department had seen my name, wanted to know if I would be interested in talking about their opening. I had an interview. They told me that they'd really like to hire me, but I'd need to meet with their director. Could I come back next week? Well, I don't know. Friday is officially my last day. I don't know if I'm allowed to come back next week. They arranged for an interview that day. That day I had an offer for another job in the company with a $2.50 raise on the day that was supposed to be my last day at work. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far. Tis grace will see me home. You see, Samuel got it. He did not spend time lamenting over the fact that God did not pick the strong, strapping, handsome, oldest son 
or the next strong, strapping young man. He waited patiently for the one whom God had chosen. In faith, I waited to the very last day. Could God in his power have done it on the first day? Certainly. Never works that way, though, does it? Always the smallest, the last, the worst prepared. Because then it is obviously, no doubt about it, the providence of God. Now, y'all might be thinking that your pastor's gotten a little addle in his middle age. He jumped right over the pastoral prayer. Yeah. But sometimes the power of God works. Because it seems to me, now's the time. So we're going to do something we've done a couple of times now. I want you to stand. Find somebody else in the room that doesn't share your last name that you have not seen in the last 48 hours except for walking in these doors. It might actually mean you have to cross the aisle or even go back a few rows. cannot be someone that you greeted this morning already. When you find that person... Share with them the joy you had last week that God provided. And share with them the concern you have for next week that God needs to provide. Great and mighty God, we come to you as your people. Your people of faith. We recognize you as our Father, as the one who cares for us, provides for us. All too often, just like with earthly fathers, we ignore the things that you put before us. We do not come to you when we have need. We are determined to take care of it ourselves. We confess this. We turn away. We seek to be first and foremost your people, and therefore we lift to you those concerns, those challenges, those things that we face with an assurance that you hear, an assurance that you provide. We lift up in prayer all the names that were on our list this day and all the names that we hold close on our hearts, knowing that your spirit is enough, enough for whatever they need, comfort and strength, healing and transition. We give you thanks for all the things you have already done in our lives, the ways that you provide for us, the ways in which you bring into our lives one another, that we might have rich community. Help us to recognize that you work through the smallest and the least You work through the poorest and the least prepared. And therefore, they are the greatest, even if we don't see it in our eyes and in our system. Open our eyes that we might see it tomorrow. And that we might exalt those whom you use. All these things we lift up in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. 
just as we lift up the prayer he taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.